Johns Hopkins, Baltimore, Maryland. For three months in 1999, ABC News was given unprecedented access inside one of America's leading hospitals. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, a team of journalists was allowed to witness intimate, candid moments, what really goes on inside a hospital. Now, some of those stories on Hopkins 24-7. You already heard, though. You knew that I was Hopkins online. Dr. Tamara Dildy is a third-year resident in the Hopkins Emergency Department, a long way up the medical ladder, but still in the process of becoming a doctor. There are some days where you see the same old thing, and then something, boom, new, will come in. I doubt so. I don't know. And it changes the pace of everything, and, and it challenges you. We need a stretcher. Arriving is an eight-year-old boy with a head injury. Dr. Dildy must decide how serious it is. I think dealing with a child that's injured and in pain is like dealing with anyone else in pain. And I think most physicians are afraid of children in pain. Kids are much more emotive. They will show how it is that they feel, whether it is that they close down, close their eyes, and won't talk to you or cry and scream and won't stop screaming. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? What's your favorite cartoon? Tom and Jerry. I like Tom and Jerry too. They sometimes get hurt, right? What happened? So you just got hurt too, okay? You got a couple of boo-boos, but we're gonna make you feel better, sweetheart, all right? If you can just distract them for a second, distract them away from their terror, their fear, you have an in, and you maybe have a way of getting to what's bothering them. X-rays, which well, don't hurt. Get a shot. I don't think so, because you I have. I want to get a shot. Hey, Chris, listen to me one second. Chris, this is really scary, but I don't think you're gonna get a shot. Okay? How old are you? Daddy, how old am I? You tell me how old are you? Are no. You don't know. Okay. When's your birthday? It's like asking an adult patient. You know been watching basketball lately? Yeah. Watching the Knicks. Are you watching the games now? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who do you want to win? I want to like New York win. Yep. I hear you. OK, I can cheat. I can be your doctor now, because you said the right team. <laughs> when you connect with the patient, the patient connects yeah. with you for a second. It's like, hmm. And then it makes it easier to ask the next question, questions that are difficult to ask, questions that are very intrusive to ask. That's what, you know, everyone's worried about. Dealing with patients when they want help can be hard enough. Sure. Many of these patients had to be persuaded to come here in the first place. It's like the anorexia I could be proud of because I was in control. The bulimia I could be proud of because I was in control. But when I get to the binging part of bulimia, just don't even ask me about it because I don't do that. In Hopkins Psychiatric Department, Dr. Angela Guarda conducts group therapy for inpatients struggling with eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia. Binging is so sneaky, it's so secretive, and it's so revolting, you know? know it seems so out of control. It seems so out of control, and it's like, I don't want anyone to see that side of me. I, I don't even want people to imagine me doing that. The compulsive behavior of these patients can be as out of control as an addict's or an alcoholic's. Sometimes when I look around the room, it's quite sobering to think that Perhaps at least one of those will not make it past the age of 35. Anorexia nervosa is often considered a minor psychiatric illness. It's not seen as very serious by the lay public. It certainly is a problem insurance-wise. It's not recognized as life-threatening by a lot of insurances, but it is a deadly illness. In fact, of all psychiatric conditions, it is the most lethal. Living with anorexia, it's, it's like a hell. You really lose who you are, and you almost become just the disorder. Caroline weighed only 80 when admitted to Hopkins, underweight by some 50 pounds and near death. At 23, she had full-blown osteoporosis in her hips and back from malnutrition. Everything down to just the way your insides work, nothing works right. You damage so much. You know, I mean, I was so close to death, you know, your levels, all your blood levels drop and, and everything's haywire. And... and I remember walking through an airport and she could barely walk. I mean, she collapsed on the ground and I had to help her get up to get to the plane so that we could make it to, on the next section of our trip. Even Caroline's husband, 
just out of medical school, didn't realize how serious her anorexia was until it was almost too late. And one day I got a call from her counselor who said that Carrie was having a breakdown, that she had just gotten to the point where she was thinking about killing herself. I didn't know what to do, you know. I was a doctor and yet I still didn't know what to do. It's miserable. I'm 22 years old, you know, and I feel like a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just hang in there. We don't have to solve the problems overnight. Yeah. One day at a time, okay? Yes, good morning. I'm Dr. McHugh. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet this you. This morning, nice. Caroline has agreed to discuss her case with Dr. Paul McHugh, chairman of the psychiatry department, and an assembly of medical students and staff. That you were worried about your health? Oh, definitely. I mean, I used to get in the shower and have panic attacks because I could right. see everything. It, I don't know how to explain it, but you get a sense that you know you're dying, and you know it's coming soon, and you feel like you're locked within a prison and you can't get out. Uh, you had you know? mentioned a feeling of pain. Can you describe that? It numbed the, the emotional store. pain, but I had extreme physical pain from being so thin. And I could see my emaciated state. Yeah. And that was frightening to me. And so then I get more depressed. And then it was like a vicious circle. You know, it just it gets worse and worse and it, right. it right. just gets bigger and bigger. These are the toughest of tough cases, really. You say you put some weight on her, but she's still a cachectic uh, figure. And seeing her walk away, just looking at her clothes were still drooping off of her. And if she's reporting correctly, she knew that uh, in her emaciated state that she was running a great risk. She is exactly the kind of person who uh, we know anorexia nervosa kills. Emergency medicine, I think, encompasses everything in medicine. You don't specialize deep within one specific area, but you know a little bit about a lot of different areas. What happened, sweetheart? I was hit by a car. You were hit by a car? Here. about 15 to 20 miles an hour. 10. 10. I thought I wanted to be a surgeon, but the thing that I liked the most when I did my surgery rotation as a medical student was being down in the emergency department, seeing things happening. His pancreas hurts. Pretty funny. He says his pancreas hurts. That makes our jobs much easier. It was really busy, lots of flow. Where do you go that fast? Having a foot in a lot of different things um, and keeping on top of them. Why are you pulling your needle out? I ain't pulling this out. No. Who told you to take that out? Nobody thought I was supposed to take it out. No. Who told you that? Nobody told me, man another thing that's very attractive about being in the emergency department is your exposure one-on-one -on -one with the community that you're immersed in. Maybe some of it's being curious about people and what was it that brought them through my doors and why is it that they keep coming back and how can that problem be remedied? What were you doing? Bike. Dirt bike? Or whether it be a very affluent community or a very poor community. No, 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 head down, head down. All of us, no matter who we are, we all are looking for someone to connect with. When you have a problem, when you come in and you're scared, if someone just cares... You're worried because of the injury that you had, you could have hurt your back. You feel understood for a second, and that makes a difference, and that's terrific. Making yourself understood is sometimes a lifelong struggle for people with profound hearing loss who live outside the deaf community. Like Joe Van, 69 years old, deaf in one ear since birth, now his other ear has failed him and he must rely on lip reading. Why don't we start with you just telling me a little bit about the history of your hearing loss? I'm gonna tell you this now, okay? How did you come to find out that I had a hearing problem? It's because of my father. Mm -hmm. And uh, he used to take it out of me because I wasn't answering him. I can't really say I enjoyed my life, mm -hmm. but I got bad with it, let's put it that way. Because the problem I had most of the, that bothered me the most was I can't communicate with people. The only person right now that I can communicate with really, truly, is my brother. In other words, what you might say, I was lost in this world. Mm -hmm. But I survived. That's the main thing, I survived. Yeah. 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 So. Joe has come to Hopkins to be evaluated for a cochlear implant, surgery that in many cases can restore hearing to the profoundly deaf. Now, those first couple days, when you're first having it programmed, are very frustrating. Now, think of it now, you gotta remember one thing. 
It might not work. I said, I'm willing to take that chance. If it can give it to me, I'm willing to take it. If it don't give me anything, then I have to keep on going the way I'm going now. The profoundly deaf ear is deaf because of the specialized cells in the inner ear known as the hair cells not doing their job. To date, Dr. John Naparco has performed over 500 cochlear implants in which an electronic device stimulates the inner ear, or cochlea. Over 96% of his patients end up, he says, hearing successfully. The implant device is designed to bypass the non-working hair cells and directly activate the brain's hearing nerve by means of carefully placed electrodes. But will it work with a patient like Faith Gribble, who has led a life of almost total silence? 34 years old, Faith was born with only 5% normal hearing, meaning that anything other than loud noises is lost on her, especially the frequencies of speech. I was saying that'd be pretty different. Pretty cool. Uh -huh. cool. Neither Faith's husband nor her children are deaf. And although she's fluent in American Sign Language and lip reading, Faith has always yearned to be part of the speaking world. Gonna go in here, in here. Five year old Cody Shoemaker's progressive hearing loss started at age two. We're going to be getting started in just a little bit. Okay. You all set for the big day? Yes. Great. Do you think he understands what's about to happen? I don't know. He knows that when he wakes up, he's going to have a big bandage on his ear. Language has been defined as our ability to express our thoughts. And you can imagine that for a child who's unable to express their thoughts using either sign language or spoken language, how their world becomes closed off very quickly. Lights. When he's Stop trying to it. talk to you, you look another way no and, and don't pay attention. He gets very upset about that. <laughs> Whether he screams or he hits you or however, that's how he gets your attention. You want time out? Stop it. Cody doesn't understand very many signs, and his inability to communicate aggravates his behavioral that's not problems. Nice. I'm going to turn the lights out. Some people say that he's bad and that it's not because he's deaf. Then some people don't want to be around him because of him. It's not his fault. He didn't ask to be like this. It's just something that happened. The leaf. I'm the one who has pushed the issue to have this implant for my son, to make him to be able to hear something, even if it's just a little bit. in the emergency department. I'm very shocked at what people can do to each other. He's increased in level of consciousness now. He said his eyes are going back and forth from side to side in his head, and he's not talking. The victim of an assault, a man in his mid-30s was found lying in the street, barely conscious. He's having serious trouble breathing. He's going to need to intubate. He's going to need to intubate. I'm ready. He's got multiple lacerations from his arms. He's okay. 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 His respiratory rate kind of decreased almost a little bit. Went down he's about not, 20. He's breathing very shallow. shallow. Yeah, yeah, he's real shallow. Can someone hold him like that? Is everybody awake? They were fast. He's got a bruise right here. Do you wake? He's got a large hematoma in the back of his head. Okay, his teeth are broken. It looks like he may have a mandibular fracture and it's open. The patient's broken jaw will make it more difficult to establish an airway. Are you ready there? I'm ready. Being a senior resident, you kind of get to the point where you feel like you can handle a whole bunch of things, and then you have these very humbling experiences where you realize there's a lot that you need to learn still. Someone needs to pass over the tube. What size tube is that? No, that's a 7 out. Can you pass the 8 out? Can you place the assignment for this? We don't want no 7 out tubes. Put something in for the time being. Here, give me the tube, please. Three different tubes. Wrap the seat. Do you have the other tube? Yeah, it's coming.
when you're intubating someone, you're supposed to see the tube go through the vocal cords. So you're not putting it into the esophagus or the stomach pipe, which is bad. I can see cords, but it's just getting the tube in. It's kind of hard. That's our... Yeah. Time is running out. The patient's blood oxygen levels are falling. Okay, is this the bougie thing? Follow through the cords. Yep. We have a sat on Where's sat sat? Watch it go through the cords. Sats are 95. The DP is 114. Not yet. It's curling up in the back of his throat. Here, look. Mark, it's right there. Pick it out, pick it out. Pick it out and back. I just put it in half an hour. Another doctor has to step in, and he quickly manages to feed the air tube past the patient's broken jaw to his lungs. Okay, there we go. Got it. The patient has been stabilized. It's Dr. Dildy who's upset. I lose confidence when something like that happens. I'm beating myself up for it and replaying how I could have done that differently and what exactly went wrong. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. The main problem with the tongue, remember? Grab the jaw with both hands. And just pull up. Pull up. Okay. I try to talk it out with colleagues and replay it in my mind, learn what I could do in the future. Why couldn't you get the tongue back? I had like great visualization. There was no blood there at all. But I couldn't get the freaking tube in. Just get a tube to go around that way. I'm still like kicking myself about it, replaying it, but I'm grateful for these very humbling experiences because my learning is going to continue. Meeting challenges is really important. Don't, don't be too down about it. Anyway, well, thanks. You're welcome. Don't, don't be too down about it. The loss of confidence, or a feeling of not measuring up to society's ideals, is much of what eating disorders are about. The media's message that you need to be thin is probably the worst thing that could happen to a young woman who has a genetic predisposition to one of these disorders because it will usually trigger the onset of her dieting behavior. And once the dieting starts, one of the problems with eating disorders is that they become self-sustaining. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'd never do that, or, or anyone who does that is just, you know, self-centered and, and preoccupied with themselves and, you know, whereas it's not that at all. For me, it was taking care of everybody else but me. But for the moment, at least, Caroline seems to be trying to take care of herself. She's just returned from her first visit home since entering the Hopkins program. How did it go? This is the first time you go home. I know, it went really well. I right. mean, I had a good time. Uh -huh. um, for one thing, my husband and my relationship, it's, it's like day and night. I get up with him and we eat breakfast together and I'm not like sulking all the time. And, it's more, you know, united than two parallel lives. Great. Which is really Great. nice. Yeah. That's good. Now, um, how about uh, your body? How does well, it feel? I, like, I, I mean, know my views are really distorted, so I try not what to rely on myself. What is your view right now of your body? What oh, do you I feel think? huge. Okay. <laughs> I feel really <laughs> huge. You really doing well. You surprised, you surprised all of us. We were talking before you came in, and we were saying, most of us didn't think you were going to come back. Oh, of course I come back. So you're really <laughs> proving us wrong. <laughs> okay? We're very pleased. All right. Yeah. Bye. What is she saying about her weight? Actually, the thing I hear her saying now in group is that she has breasts and that she didn't when she came in. And as a positive? I'm not sure how she's looking at it, but she is <laughs> noting that well, she has good. breasts good. now. Well, that's good. She was saying that's the first thing her husband noticed after she'd been here good. for a while. So well, he's it. thinking positively of her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's working for me because I really wanted it to work. I've seen a lot of people come and go through here, though, who haven't wanted to get better, and it, it won't work for those people. I don't think any program can work for someone who doesn't want it. I heard you had a kind of lively evening yesterday. Yeah. You cut yourself with the razors. Mm -hmm. And where did you cut yourself? On my stomach and my arms. OK, and is that something you've done before? Actually, I took scissors before and tried to cut off my fat on my stomach before. It's not uncommon for a subset of patients with eating disorders to have impulse control problems in more spheres than just eating. I have to call my mom and just kind of say, there is alcohol stashed here. I have razors that I cut myself with here. It's humiliating. It's like your mom's finding every <coughs> single thing that you that that I use to hurt myself with. She found it all. We want you to promise you won't do it. And can you do that? Yeah, I don't have anything to do it with now. Okay. The reason for self-cutting is not primarily suicidal. Sometimes the pain is described as feeling rewarding by patients 
or to get attention. If you plan to keep cutting yourself, then we're going to tell you we can't treat you here. Okay? That's I started the self-mutilation with tiny scratches on my arms. Everybody would get, you know, really angry with me for not eating, and I would get so furious. But I didn't think I deserved to be angry. I would turn that in on myself, and I started burning my arms with cigarettes, uh, just pretty much putting them out on my arm. If you're addicted to a behavior, you have an incredible drive to continue to engage in it, even if you know it's not good for you. So the first step in treatment is to get out of the behavioral cycle. And so patients are not allowed to use the bathrooms unless there's someone, a nurse, standing outside the door who will check the toilet to make sure they don't purge. The treatment here is so much that they take away all control, which, as a lot of people know, eating disorders are, you know, are based on control issues. I mean, it's down to bathroom breaks <laughs> that, we, you know, we are extremely controlled and watched over. Initially, they don't actually select their food, the dietitian does. If they're able to finish their meals on time, they will start choosing from a menu, but they will lose that privilege if they only choose low calorie items. I mean, I'm not used to eating three big meals a day. I mean, I'm not used to doing that. I mean, I'm used to doing maybe one meal a day, one big meal or... Well, you're used to doing one binge a day. The anorexic starves today because she starved yesterday. The bulimic binges today because she binged yesterday. And to stop doing that is hard. It's hard work. On three different days, Cody, Joe, and Faith are each going in for the same cochlear implant surgery, a two-hour procedure. After recovery from the operation will come months of practice, adapting to their new sense of hearing. Okay, let's roll. Let's go. <laughs> there we go. Okay, here we go. And how these three patients adapt to hearing with the implant will vary as widely as their three very different backgrounds. You go out in the woods today, you better go. You're going to do that, do eight. It's time to take them off now. And top. So we're going to give her a little bit of oxygen to breathe in just a minute. There was, we'll small. gather. Joe, take big breaths. Let's go. Following the successful completion of the operation, patients will have to wait five weeks to recuperate before they come back to activate the implants and to see if they work. Excellent. Okay, we can close up here. times one of the reasons group therapy is helpful when you have an eating disorder is that you can see in someone else what you can't see in yourself. I can as a woman identify with what these patients are going through. I mean certainly I've dieted in my teens and in my early 20s and I understand what fear fatness is about but I don't understand you know the extreme to which it's taken in my patients. I don't know what it is but when I'm around my kids and especially eating, I'm just anxious. It's just, I don't know how to explain it. And treatment is a battle of wills. It's a struggle between the practitioner and the patient. I think that you kind of need to tell us all that you're committing to get well and to not act in self-destructive ways. But I don't know what I'm getting ways. well for. I well, mean, I, I think you don't know, and that's the honest answer, <coughs> but it's certainly for a life because the alternative is not good. My job is to convert this patient from believing that dieting is the road to her happiness to realizing that dieting is actually the major cause of all the problems she's presenting with. 
I have secret stashes of like laxatives and Epicac syrup at home. And the one thing I haven't been able to do is I haven't been able to tell my mom where that stuff is. So that she can get rid of it. Right. Well, going back to your home environment is going to be a trigger if it's somewhere where you used to restrict, binge, or purge. So you want to minimize the chances that you have easy access to stashes, for instance, of laxatives or diuretics. Um, but I'm scared house. that when I get home... You can't like have it there because as soon as you walk in, you'll tell your mom and then you'll move it. And you'll, you'll keep just one. You know, you can't, there's, you have to have them all gone. Since peer pressure is often what initiates dieting, it's not really that surprising that group therapy and the peer pressure engendered by the group is helpful to getting them back out again. What the group leader will do is try to mobilize the more senior members of the group who are doing well to confront the new patient. I can't help but think that you are begging to come back in patient. I mean, it's like you are crying out and saying, somebody do something to me before I hurt myself. Frequently, if you ask someone their history, they'll say that they started dieting because everyone else was in school. And but what happened is because of their individual vulnerabilities, that person did not diet the way the other 80% of women do. They dieted and it went across some line and became a clinical eating disorder. It feels so unpredictable sometimes. I guess what I'm most scared of really is that well, I'm keeping my meals down, I'm eating my meals in the right amount of time, and I'm doing all the right things, but I guess what I'm really scared of is I'm scared I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. I'm scared, like, I just want to get out of here so that I can go back to the way I was. I hope that that's not what I'm doing, but right now I'm just not sure. <laughs> I called my mommy. You did. Good for you. She is bald. I think it's an extremely rewarding field because I really do see patients get better. I mean, I really do see patients come back to see me two or three years later saying, thanking me and saying that it was extremely helpful to them. And they usually say the most helpful thing about you was that you were tough on me. I think patients are actually asking for somebody to take control and tell them what to do. Besides the laxatives. With their surgical scars healed, Faith, Joe, and Cody have each come back in turn to the clinic to fine tune the computers in their cochlear implant devices. One component sits on the scalp, held above the implant with a magnet, so it can be removed at bedtime. The microprocessor on this model sits behind Joe's ear, like a hearing aid. Okay. You're to listen now. And You're to listen now. I will slowly raise and I will the level slowly. of the sound. Now we're just going to present some beeps to the computer. The tones are computer-generated signals used to calibrate the implant, but at this point, no actual sounds in the room are being transmitted, just the beeps. I think, I think, I heard something. Trying to think I'm hearing things or not, but it sounds like something. Cody's been taught to hold a block to his ear, prompting him to listen. And when he hears something, to put the block in the puzzle. I'm going to say yes. Good. I'm going to say Good. yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Ready to turn it on? Then it's finally time to turn on the microphone built into the implant. Remember, it's going to sound very different, and I do not know how it's going to sound. Now, the actual sounds in the room are being processed into signals that the patient will have to learn to perceive as sound. It can be a confusing, even painful experience. You could laugh, you could cry, you could just look at you. Um, you could do nothing that's inside the fish. Uh, very slowly turn up the volume and ask everyone in here to talk. Okay, Mr. Van, can you hear me? How does it sound? Does it, can you tell like him? It. Go ahead. It'd be a little, what? Every time I, 
Every time I read it, be like, is it because of my voice it's causing that? I'm very confused right now. Katie? Nope. Hi, Faith. It's a whole new world for you today. <laughs> Did you hear yourself laugh? Yes. I didn't like that. <laughs> okay, Mr. Van. Even uh, 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 uh. I can't take it, man. I'm gonna have a yank. I can't help. Cody, where's the impact? <laughs> 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 you. Mm, my voice is too loud. I hear your voice, but what you're saying, no. Even Joe, who had some hearing in one ear, will have to learn through practice to, to sure interpret these new sounds as language. I don't expect you. To understand my voice right now. All that is doing is popping every time you say something. Mm -hmm. There's like a machine coming. Yeah, like there is. Mm -hmm. There is noise That's in the one. room. There's, there's a lot of noise, a lot of sound. There's a fan in here. Yeah. The computer makes sound. There's a lot of noise in this room, in the world. <laughs> go off or anything like that? Okay, so you swerved. Did you hit a pole or a tree or anything? No. What hurts you? My neck. Okay. I just got hit by a car like a month and a half ago. When you were walking across the street? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Okay. And I got shot in January. Uh-huh. He'd had a gunshot wound in January, come in now after a motor vehicle crash, and then told me he'd been hit by cars a couple of times in the past. And I said to him, what is it? Who is it that you're hanging out with? Where'd you get shot? On my back and my side. Yeah, did you have surgery? Yeah, surgical mark. On my side. Any allergies to medicines? No. no? Okay. Do you do you smoke or drink or use any drugs? No. What happened to your head here? Okay. You're lying to me. You do do something. How are you gonna say that? Because of the way you said it. Huh? Because of the way you said it. No, I don't do it no more. You used to use drugs. Okay. No. Okay. How are you gonna say drugs? I used to smoke cigarettes. Smoke cigarettes. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Because of the way that you said you looked at me. Because you thought you were going to get in trouble. What happened here? Did you have a blood clot in your brain? No, I got hit by uh, I think I hit by a bike. Sounds like you need to change your friends. My friends? Yeah. Why you say that? You got shot. Mm -hmm. You got hit by a car. You got hit by a bike. Someone you're hanging out or where you're no, hanging out isn't good. I was good. young. Oh. I was like five years old when I got hit by the bike. Okay. <laughs> but then you got shot this year. Yeah. yeah. I think that it's important to speak to someone who is at risk because of the way that they're living, which I hope isn't talking down to a patient, but saying, look, you know, you keep down this road and you're gonna get one thing. Hey, Joe, Joe, I'm gonna get you going soon, okay? Because everything is negative. So what are we gonna do about you? Yeah. I don't have to tell you, you know, a lot of guys your age come in dead. Stuff now, like most people are not going to hear me. A lot of people are going to blow me off and say, yeah, whatever, you know. But if one person listens and says, you know what, she's right. I was, matter of fact, I was in, this is my third accident. I got hit by a van, too. I got hit by a van. A van. Like I said, you have to change something that you're doing because you're getting hit by too many cars and you're getting shot. Right? And I'm not saying that you're a bad person. You seem like a nice guy. But... You want to make it to like being 45, which I don't think is a lot to ask. I feel you on anything you yeah. said, but I don't feel you on coming back to get shot again. I'm not saying you're definitely going to come back, but if you don't change something, you know, and you know that I'm right about this, something else is going to happen to you. I'm actually doing rounds now, so I'm going to be anorexia patient Caroline has managed to gain weight while at Hopkins, but she is still 15 to 20 pounds shy of her target weight. I'm worried about Caroline. I don't know whether Caroline will stay in treatment. I know that as she gains weight, she's going to have more and more trouble with continuing to gain weight, and yet she has a lot of weight to gain. Whatever happens, I don't want you to bolt. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're wanting to leave, I want you to try it first. Yeah. Like, it might make sense to try a couple of days and see if you can gain exactly. weight. You need to know that. 
That's, I think the time. big test is going to be Thanksgiving, right. too. Yeah, and that, yeah. actually, that's a very good test. We'll see when you come back next week yeah. how that went. And that, and that's Caroline has life-threatening anorexia, and, and her prognosis is guarded. I think that her prognosis is good if she can reach a target weight before she leaves here. I think if she leaves prematurely, her prognosis is really probably poor. I mean, going through the whole treatment pretty much is enough incentive for me to get, get to the end because mm -hmm. I don't want to have to do it again, Right. you know, mm -hmm. nor do I want to die. I too. think the role of the senior resident, the senior resident in the emergency department, particularly here at Hopkins, is to teach and provide guidance for the junior residents. I think some of the best um, attending physicians, supervising physicians that I've worked with, have been incredibly good at watching you kind of flounder a little bit and then stepping in. And I think that that's the most wonderful marriage between excellent patient care and resident teaching. Because we're never going to, I mean, residents aren't going to be perfect. They do something the first time, they're going to have difficulty with it. And having someone there who's your support, who's your backup, who watches you, it's sort of a kind of a parent who's behind you, kind of supporting you. Turn his head straight, right, right. And I hope to develop into that kind of um, teaching physician where I feel confident in my own skills and trust my knowledge of, you know, when to intervene. It's really hard to know when it's the right time to step in and help someone when they're floundering. The most common mistake is not to go deep enough. Do you see the cords or not? Yes, I can see the cords. Okay, so put it in. Don't move your hands or eyes from it at all. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Set the scope. Just want to set the scope. Good job. We're all here to learn, and in willingness to continually learn is probably the single most important factor to have in order to become the best physicians that we can be, and that's what it's about. Returning from her five-day Thanksgiving visit home, Caroline has not gained any weight. Something is wrong. By, since Wednesday, we would have ex yeah. you know, it's long enough that we would expect to see something. I know, like, some days I'll wake up and I'll feel, like, okay mm -hmm. with me. Like, I'll be like, mm, I don't look too bad. You know, I'm okay. And then, like, mm -hmm. another day could be totally the opposite. And I'll wake up and I'm like, I'm fat. I'm, I hate this. I, uh, you know. What we suggest is that you be here for a couple of days, then have a day off here, and then plan to go home again. Right now... My husband and I have no more credit. We mm -hmm. borrowed money to get me back here, up here on the train. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking at finishing this up at home. because We just have no money. It's over. I mean, big time overwhelming financially right, right now. I understand that that's scary, the expense part. It's not fact, scary. It's just we can't pay our rent right now. So, you see, Caroline's insurance coverage for this condition was two weeks of inpatient. She needs two to three months in order to stand a chance of recovering. I'm going to advise you strongly not to leave today. I don't. I think it's too soon. Okay. Her decision is whether to stay with the knowledge that she is accruing a hospital bill of a thousand dollars a day, or whether to leave. That's incredible pressure on someone who has a disorder that makes them ambivalent about being in treatment in the first place. I mean, it's like I've been in the program, and it's like the things that we're doing, even on the outpatient basis. I don't feel like I'm getting any more from that. Mm, I mean, but, I feel like I can get the same amount from someone. Well, the difference is here you gain weight and at home you didn't. I mean, are you are you set in stone about this idea about leaving? Pretty close. Well, yeah. well and we know that if you stall at this weight, your prognosis is not good. So I don't think you should leave at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, But if you decide that you're still going to leave, mm -hmm. then I think you need to be very explicit that if you lose weight, well, that was the one thing where I wanted to sign a contract where if I yeah, had started to lose weight that I would come right back. That's right. What I think we need to gain. 
you see the contact. Yeah, that same thing. Like if you know, if I haven't gained weight within a week, or I mean, because I'm supposed to be gaining weight every day, okay. you know, because that you need to come back. That's right, because you see, a huge it has now been 24 hours since Joe, Faith, and Cody each experienced their first sound with the cochlear implant. As expected, there is both excitement and frustration. Look, plug. I don't understand nothing from this here. Did you understand what I just told you? Reading your lip. I that's don't understand funny. nothing what anybody says from this. Yeah, that's what you keep saying. Yeah. Well, that's right. I want it now. I love them. It's been great. Love it. Mm -hmm. In other words, when I get that, and I expect it to be now, right now. Even though he couldn't hear, he'd always turn the radio off loud. And this morning, he turned it up loud, and he said, off. Oh, really? It was too loud. <laughs> too loud. He said, off. What bothered me the most about this thing is when I turned that child on. I mean, I rocked my hand at the golf The water? Pulled out real quick. It was real loud. We always told her when we oh, lived at home. Please. Oh. Stop slamming the cabinet. Easy on the cabinets. It was a habit. So I close it now. Oof. <laughs> because I can't stand it loud. Uh, what time is it? For Cody, Faith, and Joe, a long process has begun. It will take nearly two years, but even the once profoundly deaf can expect to achieve 60% comprehension. Look. Bop, 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 bop. Yes. yes. Okay, listen again. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Go down. A long process has begun for Caroline, too, as she takes the risk of trying to recover from anorexia without the discipline and the reinforcement of the Hopkins program. I know it's going to take a lot of hard work. I mean, I was just so malnourished. I was extremely close to, to death. But I think for me, it's going to be basically keeping structure in my life, keeping busy, and making sure that I feel like I'm worth something or I'm, I'm, I'm making, accomplishing something. Dr. Guarda's concern is that Caroline is still 15 pounds below her target weight. She certainly stayed till her insurance no longer wanted to pay for her treatment. However, she really ought to have stayed for two further months. And this is the crisis that the insurance restrictions have put us in, that we're unable to treat patients adequately because there's nobody to pay for the treatment. In the end, when it comes down to it, it's going to be me that decides whether or not I'm going to succeed or fail.